sinners and thieves We lifted up from the ashes And out came the song of the redeemed The song of the redeemed Thank you. That's that's a new one. I haven't heard that before. Have you guys done that before? Oh, you have? <laughs> Maybe. Maybe not one year. Uh, to the all-boy band this morning. Uh, all right. Good morning. I'm Orville, one of the ministers here. Um, last Sunday, we had a guest preacher, and Katie and I were away. We had a big ordination, and two of our uh, members were ordained as new United Church ministers. Uh, so Katie and I are back, and nice to be with you. Want to have you say hi to someone near you. Let me just say, um, and I'm going to be talking about this quite a bit this morning, about the whole welcome and witness aspect out, coming out of the Scripture of what Jesus said. We hope if, 
if you come into this place, we hope you feel greeted, you feel comfortable, uh, you feel like you can ask questions and investigate anytime, anywhere about anything. So I, I already met somebody who uh, was first time back after something like a number of years. And that, that's kind of cool. So could you say hi to someone and just find out how long they've been coming here? All right, find out a little bit of their story. Go. Welcome back. We hope you get, uh, after the service, we hope you can grab a coffee or tea and uh, continue that visit. Um, I'm going to turn things over to Ronnie for a moment. Ronnie uh, is the coordinator of our mission and outreach around here, and she has some things to share. Morning, Ronnie. Good morning. <laughs> Hi. How, how, how are we doing this morning? Good? We're awake? Woo! All right. Can you turn to the outreach column? There are all kinds of beautiful words there that were penned and crafted for you to read. Um, I want to draw your attention to the second announcement. Are you that person out there with a passion for communication? And maybe outreach, but you haven't had an opportunity to express it fully yet. Um, maybe you're reading this announcement and you're thinking we have 11 different outreach projects. How am I going to do displays for 11 projects? We will make it easy for you. If this intrigues you, we will make sure that you have what you need. So you won't have to worry about content. And you won't have to worry about coordinating 11 different projects. Speak to me, I'll coordinate the projects. And the only thing you have to do is be artistic, as you like. Sounds good? All right, if you're interested in that, please talk to me. The other announcement is about today. Today is what date is today? June 1st. June 1st, after the 9 a.m., we're gonna learn all about our fifth trip to Malawi. We're gonna see a video in a minute. Two words come to mind relationship building in Christ's name, and sustainability. Have a look. We've been before, but three years will have passed and we need to go again. That's what you do with old friends and new. You plan times to get together in love and support celebrating good times and encouraging each other in times of struggles, praying with each other, working together. And so it's time to go again. Is this your time? Is May 2015 the time when you say yes to God's calling? There's something about saying yes when you know God's nudging you. Doors are opening, passions are stirring within. When the messages say the same thing, go. Be my hands and feet. Meet with your brothers and sisters in Christ on the other side of the world and walk alongside them compassionately in friendship and love. 
Learn from them about humility and hope, what it means to rely on the great provider to provide the daily basics daily. Participate in a worship service in an African prison. Do something outrageous for the God who loves us outrageously. Step out of your comfort zone, knowing God will be beside you, enabling and empowering. Reach out to strangers, though you may only be able to communicate with a smile or handshake. Then it happens. You suddenly realize you're basically the same. In the ways that really count, children of God, followers of Jesus, embracing the Great Commission, befriending widows and orphans, doing something new for your Lord and Savior. <laughs> Okay, thank you, Ronnie. Something worth considering, right? Two other things I want to highlight. Um, one is overseas also. There's about 38 or 40 of this congregation who ha are sponsoring an orphan at the Wellington Orphanage in Sierra Leone. If you are and would like to send a letter to them, uh, a couple of our folks are going on Saturday, so you can deliver your letter to Smith's Funeral Homes. They're going to collect them for us, and they'll have them all ready anytime Monday to Friday to Smith's this week, and they'll make sure they get to Sierra Leone. Uh, Abby Markison is going on Saturday. So think about that if you have a foster child at the Wellington Orphanage. Last thing. We have these yellow cards in front of you, particularly if you're uh, a newcomer or a visitor and want more info or you want to make a connection. Could you take one of those and fill them out? Katie and I would love to connect with you and our welcome team coordinated by Joy. We can answer questions. And if you've been here for a while, a couple of months, and you think, yeah, I could handle this place full time, We'd love to have you join. Uh, on June 22nd, three weeks from today, we're having an official welcome reception of new members, and Katie and I are having a little orientation session on the day before, Saturday morning. We would love to have you. If you've been around here for a while and want to stay with us, please come and join. Let us know, and we'll see you that Saturday and that Sunday. Thank you. Over to you. <laughs> Thanks, Arv. Oh, why don't you uh, stand and sing with us? We're going to sing some songs of praise.
cross for words with all to say lord you take my breath away still my soul my soul cries out for you are holy and as i look upon your name circumstances fade away now your glory steals my heart for you are holy yes you are Who is church for? Who gets to be part of the Jesus gathering? How much do you have to know and be sure about? Can someone participate in church even if he or she is still working things out? That's the questions I want to get to. And I want to try and answer that and get at it from one verse I'm going to read. I'm going to read you eight verses here. And there's one in particular that we're going to unpack. 
This is uh, post-Easter, post-resurrection, just before Jesus leaves this earthly life, just before what we know as the ascension. Let me read Acts chapter 1. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, is this the time when you will restore the kingdom to Israel? Jesus replied, It's not for you to know the times or periods that the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. When he had said this, as they were watching, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. While he was going, they were gazing up toward heaven, Suddenly, two men in white robes stood by them. They said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking up toward heaven? This Jesus, who has been taken up from you into heaven, will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. Then they returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey away. When they had entered the city, they went to the room upstairs where they were staying, Peter and John and James, and Andrew and Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James, son of Alphaeus, and Simon the Zealot, and Judas, son of James. All these were constantly devoting themselves to prayer, together with certain women, including Mary, the mother of Jesus, as well as his brothers. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God for it. And we hope and pray that from this we can discern answers to our questions. Who is this gospel? Who is this Jesus for? Who gets to belong and be welcomed in? As we uh, prepare to bring uh, a worship offering, I invite you to join me in prayer. How long is our list of gratitude, O God? A glorious day like this for all of us. Music that we can sing and worship. Comfortable place, friends around. Ideas to challenge us and your spirit present. How long is the list of our gratitude? Please receive our offerings. We bring also the allegiance and the thanks of our hearts. For Christ's sake and in his name, amen. Why don't you stand and sing with us?
just come amongst us this morning and fill this place with your spirit. Holy Spirit, come. That we might see you in a new way this morning. That we might uh, feel your presence and just feel so overwhelmed with joy and love that we can't help but share it. Jesus called the apostles and his disciples to go and uh, be witnesses into the world. You call us to do that too. And to share this wonderful gift of love that you've given us. Come Lord Jesus, come. Pray this all in your Son. In a holy and awesome name. Amen. <clears throat> Thanks, Ryan. I want to read you again what might be one of the most important verses, I think, in all of Scripture. I'm convinced it is a required activity for each of us who are trying in some way to be followers of Jesus. 
the quality of life and the peace and joy of many of our friends and family depend on us fulfilling this activity. And it's, it's absolutely essential mindset for we as a congregation. Our future depends on it. Listen, Jesus said, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. We're to be witnesses because it changes lives. Let me use Diane as an example. Listen to her story. And this is going to be, Diane's here this morning, this is going to be in the United Church Observer this month. 200,000 people across the country are going to read this. In the spring of 2003, I found myself in bed with double pneumonia. For whatever reason, I tuned in to the Christian television station. What struck me was how nice the CTS people were, so full and so positive as they shared stories of faith. I wanted to be like them. Six years later, in 2009, over Easter dinner, my sister-in-law suggested attending a service at Wellington Square United in Burlington. When I first walked in, I couldn't believe how noisy and alive it was. People were talking, laughing, hugging. Any of that happen today? Something inside me stirred. I kept attending each Sunday, but always sat behind a pillar invisible to the congregation, feeling vulnerable. I hoped that someone would notice me, but low self-esteem kept me from reaching out. In June 2010, I developed a herniated disc. The pain was relentless and excruciating. To cope at times, I visualized Jesus with his arms wrapped around me. When I went for short walks, I held out my right hand and imagined Jesus holding it as we walked together. I asked God for help through every small task, a bearable drive home, or a shower without pain. God answered those prayers. God never abandoned me in the depths of my being. I believe God understood my anxiety and fear. I continued to attend Sunday services at Wellington Square, found great comfort in the music. Each song seemed to have a special message for me, reassuring me that God is there and to hang on. It took five months before the herniated disc finally healed itself and the pain eased. One Sunday it was announced that a small study group was beginning called Power of bless a Blessing. I decided to join, and my life changed. I met people who became close friends, discovered how God's blessings can empower my life. God had begun my transformation from, I can't do it, to, I'll try because God is with me. As I look back, I can see how God gradually opened one door after another. And so my attitude now is, I can learn how to serve God with confidence. I have a voice, and God has a purpose for me. And Diane ended with the scripture verse, I can do all things in Christ who strengthens me. Great, isn't it? To hear that? Yeah. Yeah. By the way, Diane's going to be serving you communion this morning. I'll let you try and figure out which one she is. So, when you think of Diane's story, you heard all of that, and I edited it down. There's a lot, she gives us a lot more details in the United Church Observer article. But when you think of her story, were there witnesses to her? I say yes. Her sister-in-law and this place. Her sister-in-law sensed there was a spiritual hunger and search going on in Diane, and she invited her to her church. 
And then the second witness was this place. When she walked in, there was an atmosphere amongst the people, the music, the service, all witnessed, all bearing witness to her that God was in this place, God was present, that faith was fun, that hope and friendship, acceptance and belonging was available. Jesus said, you will receive power and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and to the ends of the earth. Today's scripture that I read follows a month, five weeks after Easter, as the story has continued. Jesus was raised from the dead on Easter, and now he's reconvened his scattered, fearful, disillusioned disciples. He has them all around, him, and he's talking to them. He'd earlier commanded his disciples to love one another and go make disciples. Now, just before he leaves them, he makes this promise, or, or, or is it a game plan? Is it an agenda that we're to fulfill? It, it's not really clear, but he says, you will receive power and you will be my witnesses. I wish the Greek had been a little clearer, and you're supposed to be, I want you to be. But he just says, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses. You'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem, that's right close to home. In Judea and Samaria, that's the neighborhood and region around you, and to the very ends of the earth. You will be my witnesses, says the risen Christ. Okay, so what does that mean? What is a witness? What was a witness back then? What would his first followers have heard and understood? What would it have looked like to them? You will be my witnesses. Let me explain it this way. In that world of the first century, when someone was enthroned as king, a new authority... It would take effect through heralds, town um, criers, going out all through the territory with the news, we have a new king. They would announce and proclaim. And that was always received as good news because in that ancient world, if there was no government, no authority, no one in charge, it was chaos. There was no security, police. Uh, there was no system at all. It was chaos. And everybody knew even a bad government was better than no government. So the heralds, the messengers, would go off to the far reaches of the kingdom to proclaim they were the witnesses. There is a new king. There is a new government in authority. And that's what was being announced that's what Jesus says. You will be my proclaimers, my witnesses. That's what's being shared in the life of Jesus and in his death and resurrection to new life. God is declaring him king, king of the universe. Get the news out. Announce, proclaim, be witnesses. So that starts us thinking about why. Why should we now? Yeah, I can see it 2,000 years ago when it was new information. But everybody knows about Jesus and Christianity now, don't they? Actually, no, they don't. And there's more and more evidence. Let me just read you one quote from a sociological researcher. More and more people whose ancestors were Christians have no idea what we Christians are even talking about. This is in the North American context. Many people have no Christian memory, no church to return to. They don't even know what church their grandparents stayed away from. I knew you'd think that one out. 
some people, some people once sat through a church's confirmation class, a 13 or 14 year old, when they were teens, but it didn't take. What they once kind of learned is now no more available to their consciousness than my high school French is to me. Uh, you weren't supposed to get that, Joe. <laughs> All right. So the need to proclaim, to be a witness, is certainly there. The fastest growing category of religious affiliation in Canada is no religion. It's not evangelical Christianity. It's not Muslim, Islam, or Hinduism. The fastest growing category, and it's going exponentially up, is no religion. It'll be 33 to 35% before the end of this decade. So let's talk, that's the need, that's the why. And let's talk about who, or more correctly, to whom. To whom should we witness? On the one hand, any and all. On the other hand, only at the right time and in the right way. Give me a minute to unpack those. No barriers, any and all. Andy Stanley says, I grew up attending churches designed for church people. The unspoken message to the outside world was, once you start believing and behaving like we do, like us, then you can belong here. Then you're welcome to join us. And Andy began to question that, and we should too. Look at Jesus' first followers. They didn't have it all figured out. They didn't have their lives all on course. What a ragtag bunch they were. Almost pathetic. Jesus despaired at times. And yet, he befriended them, chose them, drew them in, raised them up, coached them, and sent them out. So, who is the church for? Who gets to be part of the Jesus gathering? How good do you have to be to be here? Which sins, if any, disqualify a person? Can the church welcome sinners? How much baggage do you have to check at the door before being admitted? How much do you have to know and be sure about can someone participate in church if he or she is still working things out? Around here, we're trying to say, yes, someone can still. No barriers, and any and all are welcome. At the same time, I would advise that we're strategic, gentle, intelligent, humble, in the way we witness and invite, when and to whom. Timing and approach or method or style, they matter. Not everyone is equally open and receptive. In every life, there are times when we're more spiritually receptive or less. Here's Karen's story. I built this sermon around two of our members, Diane and Karen, and here's Karen's story. I grew up going to church every Sunday until I was about 16 years old. After that, even though I didn't go to church, I always believed there was more beyond this life, but that was about it. In 2005, my dad was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. I went back to church, and I found it very comforting during his illness and after his death. This is when I think I started to feel there's a lot more to a spiritual life than just going to church every so often. I started to open my eyes to the beauty and wonder of God. I decided, decided to start looking for a church again. And when I moved to Burlington early in 2011, I searched online and found Wellington Square. 
The day I walked into the church changed my life. I felt an instant connection. The first service left me crying. I felt as though the sermon was directed right at me. I think Katie was preaching that day. <laughs> Later in that year, I lost my job, and it was Christian music that helped me get through the rough times. It became my comfort. Around this time, I listened to a sermon online about asking for forgiveness for your sins. And that same Sunday, the sermon at Wellington also had a similar theme. I closed my eyes, I asked for forgiveness, and that I wanted to be made new. I wanted the Holy Spirit in my life, and I felt a total weight lift off my shoulders and a warmness wash over me. And I was baptized in January 2013. In the past two and a half years, I have never felt so much peace in my life because I know that God is with me, always. I'm amazed every day. I wish I'd never drifted from church and faith. I would have been calmer and had peace through everything. That's from Karen. She's in England today, but uh, she had written that out for me to share I love reading that one, too. Knowing many details of her story, note, her receptivity increased through life circumstances. Her father's illness, stress at work, family events. There is a right time and better ways to be a witness. Karen might not have been open at another time in her life, but a few years ago, she went online and found this place, was welcomed in. And now, I can tell you, because she was welcomed, accepted, coached by Katie, Karen has just brought her accountant skills to become a servant leader on our finance team, and we're all high-fiving and cheering, because she's good. So... What might be some barriers to our witness? What might keep people away from here? I'm thinking collectively now for us as a congregation. What might turn them off or make it harder to connect? This is complex, and it's not always clear-cut. And I want to give you just two examples, clothes and cliques. There's all kinds of things we need to be aware of that could turn people off or scare them away. I'm just going to talk about clothes and cliques for a minute. Clothes, first of all. Anybody notice anything different about me this morning? <laughs> blue jeans. I have never worn blue jeans. In my memory, in 18 years here, I have never worn blue jeans on Sunday morning here. Tori, you didn't notice that. Oh, you did? Okay. <laughs> And that was, it was really intentional. I thought about Friday. I thought, oh, should I? I mean, I usually wear a golf shirt or something at this service, but I've never worn blue jeans. But what does this say? It says, just come as you are. You're welcome. Jesus doesn't bar people by what they're wearing. If I had been wearing this, and we're about to have communion... But let's, let's just do this. <laughs> All right. If I come out and started the service, <laughs> what, what does this say if I'm like this? It depends who you are. To you folks, somebody might say, who is he, the grand poobah? Or... <laughs> But, okay, let me flip it. I do the uh, communion today at 11 o'clock. I will be coming out like this because that group of people, are a higher proportion of them, have been worshiping all their lives. They understand, and for them, the sacrament is high holy mystery. It's a sacred moment. And me wearing this is signaling symbolically that this is really important. 
This is God present. Close. It's complex. It depends who you are and what messages you're reading. You smelling what I'm cooking here? All right. Um, I'm going to go without. Okay? I'm going back to uh, 9 o'clock normal. But you know what? At 11 o'clock, I'm going to do the reverse. I'm going to do the whole service like this. And then at this point in the sermon, I'm taking it off. Yeah. <laughs> but <laughs> let me rephrase that. <laughs> let me let me talk uh, close cliques. How much should we talk to our friends on a Sunday morning? How often should we say hi to a stranger? Will you weird them out, scare them off? Diane said she hid behind a post for a few months, but hoped someone would speak to her. Experts say most people decide whether a church will accept them and they can fit in very quickly. They, their antenna, they make that decision. Often on their first visit, Definitely within two or three visits. They have a sense. So, please say hello <laughs> to those around you. Whether you've been here 10 years or 10 weeks, say hi to someone. Help them feel glad to be here. There is somewhere around you a Diane or a Karen or a Rob, Rob Fisher. A lot of you know him, he's an Air Canada pilot. He's in New Brunswick this morning. I got an email from him. Rob still talks about and reminds me of the first time he walked into this building. It's 12 or 13 years ago now, but an elderly woman greeted him. She's in her 90s now. Greeted him, welcomed him, found a wee bit found out a wee bit from him, she chatted him up. And that let him know that he was noticed, that he was important, that someone cared. My point is, with, just with our clothes or with our cliques, we signal to people and we are witnessing what kind of Jesus place this is. And we need to... It's complicated, but we need to think about it. That's why 15, 18 years ago, we made the hard decision to have two completely different, diverse services. We want different types of people to know it's okay the way they're dressed, or to have coffee, or to feel the sacred richness of a sacramental moment. Jesus said, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes, and you will be my witnesses. Let everything that we say and do in this place, and let everything that you say and do in your world out there, proclaim the King of the universe, the King of love, Jesus Christ. Amen. So friends, we come to Christ's table, and it is Jesus' table. It's part of the worldwide church, but that doesn't mean you have to be a member of Wellington Square. If you want to follow Jesus, this is his table. And you could have been raised Baptist or Lutheran or Catholic or nothing. It's still Jesus' table, and he welcomes you. So I invite all 
to participate in this sacrament. And I would ask us to prepare ourselves by praying a prayer together. Ken's going to throw it on screen for us. Will you join together? The Lord be with you. O oh God, in this world where many hunger and thirst, we are thankful for the humblest bread and the simplest drink. Yet this bread and drink are much more than that. They are the sacred reminder of your son's death and of the words of promise he spoke to his disciples, Abide in me, and I shall abide in you. We lift our thanksgiving for this table and its place in our lives. And let Christ be the head of the table and the head of our lives this day and forever. Jesus Christ, when he was at table with his first disciples, took bread, gave thanks to Almighty God. And then he broke it and gave it to them saying, this is my body broken for you. And then in a similar fashion, after the supper, he took a cup passed it to them, saying, This cup is the new covenant, sealed in my blood. Drink this in remembrance of me. The gifts of God for the people of God. Hallelujah. I'm going to ask our servers to come and join me at the front. And as they're coming, I remind you of a couple of things. There will be a center station that is gluten-free, and there will be stations on each side of regular bread. And Bob is putting out, thanks Bob, is putting out our crisis care basket. Uh, We have uh, a special fund that is used for immediate needs in the Hamilton Burlington area. And anything you can give to that will be appreciated and used wisely and well. Heather and Penny will be front and center. This is the gluten-free station. Hi, Katie. Sorry. And if you're trying to guess, this is Diane. (laughs) (laughs) Please, please come. be more than this Oh breath of God come breathe within There must be more than this Spirit of God we wait for you Fill us up
set the captives free. Leave us abandoned to your praise. Lord, let your glory fall. Lord, let your Sing with us.
and for all you've done and yet to do with every breath I'm praising you desire of nations and every heart you alone are God As we were, uh, as Orv was talking, um, I was just reading along uh, in Acts chapter 4, uh, about uh, a couple chapters later, you already see Peter and John out in the world uh, witnessing there in, um, in a temple talking to priests and Sadducees and uh, lots of people who are sort of questioning Jesus. And let me just read you um, Acts chapter 4. Um, at this point, uh, Peter's talking about the, uh, the paralyzed man that Jesus has healed through the roof. It says, Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers and elders of the people, if we are being called to account today for an act of kindness shown to a man who was lame and are being asked how he was healed, then know this, you and all the people of Israel, it is by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead, that this man stands before you healed. Jesus is the stone you builders rejected, which has become the cornerstone. Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. And when they saw the courage of Peter and John, they realized that they were unschooled un, uh, and ordinary men. And they were astonished and recognized that these men had been with Jesus. So it's not just uh, 
it's not just Orb, it's not just Katie, it's each and every one of us. It's ordinary people who, uh, who are witnesses of Jesus out into this world to our friends and family and strangers that we meet. Uh, we have an opportunity to just share the love of Jesus that he has given to us with one another and celebrate. And thanks be to God for it. So we're going to do one more. Is it true today that when people pray, cloudless skies will break? will shake. Yes, it's true. And I believe it. I'm living for you. I'm living for you. Is it true today that when people pray, we'll see dead men rise? set free. Yes, it's true. And I believe it. I'm living for you. I'm living for you. I'm going to be a history maker in this land. I'm going to be a speaker of truth to all mankind I'm gonna stand I'm gonna run into your arms into your arms again Yes, it's true today that when people stand with the fire of God and the truth in hand, we'll see miracles, we'll see angels sing, we'll see broken hearts making history. It's true. Oh, and we believe it. We're living for you. We're living for you. I'm going to be a history maker in this land. I'm going to be a speaker of truth to all mankind. I'm gonna stand I'm gonna run into your arms into your arms again into your arms into your arms again Uh, who would like to pray a little more or has a special prayer need, the prayer team is gathering over there. And uh, feel free to come and join Lynn and Penny and Brian. Let me offer this blessing as we head out into the week ahead. 
Send us forth, O God, send us forth radiating your love, your caring, your joy, your hope, and the commitment to serve your world. In Jesus' name, amen. Have a wonderful week. We're going to play you out of here.